Hi everyone, um, welcome to this webinar, the Creaky Joints hosted webinar. Oops, sorry about that. On pregnancy and family planning concerns of women with autoimmune conditions. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. If you are having any trouble hearing me, please uh, use the chat box and you'll be able to send me a message and we'll try and do what we can uh, to, to help you with any technical difficulties. So I just, I know it's the top of the hour and we have a lot, a lot of very exciting ground to cover today. Um, and so I just want to start by welcoming everyone, welcoming our guest speaker, Dr. Megan Flows, who we're very excited to have today. Um, I am just going to start with a few housekeeping rules before I can introduce Dr. Close. So everyone is, if you, if you haven't already, <laughs> Realize that everyone is muted. Um, the reason we do that is because we're recording this webinar, and so we wanted to um, record with good quality audio, so we can share this recording with those who are unable to attend today's webinar. So any questions that you have, and we invite questions throughout this webinar, please, by all means, send them throughout the webinar using your chat window. At the end of the webinar, we will try and address all your questions as best as we can, given that we, uh, we're under sort of a one hour time frame here. Um, so with that said, I'm, I'm gonna quickly introduce Dr. Megan Close today, uh, who is our guest speaker today. And Dr. Close is a rheumatologist in Durham, North Carolina, uh, and an associate professor of medicine at Duke University. Her research focuses on the management of rheumatic diseases in patients of childbearing age and includes the Duke Autoimmunity in Pregnancy Registry, which includes over 500 pregnancies in women with rheumatic disease seen in the last decade. Dr. Close is also uh, leading the, a, a group called the Reproductive Concerns Research Group. Many of you might have heard that, which is part of a larger collaborative research group um, called the as is CRG or the autoimmune and systemic inflammatory syndrome research group and that is part of PICORNET or the National Patient Centered Research Network. So a lot of in great information there and again you know we'll be putting up all this information and a recording of this webinar so anything that you've missed you can always go back to you're also free to reach out to any of us. With that said, um, I'm really excited. It's a pleasure to uh, to introduce to you Dr. Megan Close. Uh, Dr. Megan Close, take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk about uh, what is really my favorite topic, which is um, how to manage rheumatic diseases during pregnancy. Um, a lot of the time I, I spend my time talking to doctors and um, I really love talking to patients directly, however, because um, patients always have such great questions. You all are living with uh, the decisions that you're trying to make, and um, I really hope that um, having more information will make will make making decisions and and having your family um, easier for you. So um, here we go. First, my conflicts of interest. So I do get um, financing and financial support from several um, pharmaceutical companies uh, for our work. So to outline what we're doing uh, today, first I'm gonna talk about some basic principles of managing different autoimmune diseases um, at, um, during pregnancy, how you sort of balance um, the disease activity and the disease damage of these illnesses with medications that you control the, uh, to control them uh, during pregnancy and how you balance that. And then we're gonna be um, answering, hopefully just a lot of, of your questions. Um, I'll probably answer some of your questions in these first uh, set of slides, but, um, but I also wanna hear from you. So please do send in your, um, your questions as well. Um, I've also prepared some questions because I spend some of my time uh, lurking on Facebook on patient groups actually to really learn what the experience is of living with a rheumatologic disease and, and having a pregnancy and having babies and, and so on. And um, so I see what a lot of women's questions are to each other. So I've actually um, taken some of those and, and we'll be answering some of those here um, as well today. 
Um, some of this data that I'm going to be showing today is based on um, a reproductive health survey that actually some of you might have participated in. Um, this past year, uh, in tandem with arthritis power and creaky joints, we um, had over 200, about 250 women uh, complete a reproductive health survey online. This was just a one-time online survey that people did. It probably took them 15 to 30 minutes. Um, so these are the, this is sort of the outline of the people that, uh, that, that reported information to us. So as you can see, the, the majority were white or Caucasian uh, with a small number of Hispanic women. Most, uh, many, many were college educated or, or postgraduate degrees. Um, the most common diagnosis in this population was rheumatoid arthritis, followed by juvenile inflammatory arthritis, but these were all adults, so people who'd been diagnosed as a child and then had grown up, um, and some ankylosing spondylitis, and then you can see there's a few other uh, people on the, in the survey as well. The average age at the time of the survey was 40, but the average age of diagnosis was actually about 21 years old. So these are really um, data from women who really have lived through the experience of, of having kids. So we're gonna come back to this data um, several times um, over the evening um, to help answer some of our questions. But first we're really gonna jump into sort of how, how do you balance the risk of your rheumatic disease um, your medications when it comes to time for pregnancy. And I think that um, really for, for most rheumatic and autoimmune diseases, um, the thought that the, that the damage, potential damage to a developing fetus and to the length of your pregnancy from really active inflammation is actually more dangerous than many of our medications. Um, so we are all sort of conditioned to think that medications are um, foreign, they're chemicals, they're something that are not supposed to be in your body, and therefore they must be terrible in pregnancy. And what we have found through lots of data is that actually many of the medicines that we generally prescribe are not problematic in pregnancy, and actually being pregnant with a rheumatologic disease can actually harm, um, unfortunately, the developing fetus or the pregnancy. Um, but that medications can actually sometimes decrease those risks to the to the fetus and the pregnancy. So active inflammation from rheumatic diseases is often more dangerous than the medications that we use to treat them. But not all drugs are made equally, and certainly some drugs are better than others. So sort of the three key steps, I think, to achieving the best possible outcomes for your pregnancy when you have an autoimmune disease is number one, avoid pregnancy when your disease is active. So that means timing your pregnancy. So unfortunately, women with autoimmune diseases don't have the luxury that a lot of other women do of just kind of getting pregnant whenever it happens. Um, you, you can, but that certainly sets your pregnancy up for being much more complicated um, and potentially leading to a lot more heartbreak for you. So avoiding pregnancy when your disease is active is key. Um, and so contraception is, is really essential for that. And we're gonna talk about some contraceptive issues in a few minutes. Um, number two and three sort of go together. Number three is maintaining low disease activity during pregnancy, um, um, as well as monitoring and treating any kind of disease activity that comes up. And so that often means taking medications to help control the disease instead of letting it flare um, and, and, and cause problems. So the, the disease that we have the best data for is lupus. Um, the main reason for that is that that's where the most of the pregnancies are because lupus causes or is more common in really young women, whereas rheumatoid arthritis, the average age of onset is over 40. For lupus, it's in the 20s. So there's just more pregnancies in women with lupus. Um, so we have a lot of good data on lupus pregnancies. And, um, and we sort of extrapolate or we take that data and apply it to other diseases and, and see that it, it holds up pretty well. So this is actually data that um, I published um, 13 years ago, back when I was in training. Um, and we looked at the um, Hopkins lupus pregnancy cohort. So this was at the time the largest pregnancy cohort or largest group of pregnancies in women with lupus that had been followed. And what we found was that the women who had really active disease, really active lupus during pregnancy, had twice as much pregnancy loss 
So you can see that 7% um, of those uh, with active disease um, had a miscarriage, but 16% of those with really active disease had a stillbirth. And a stillbirth is a pregnancy loss after 20 weeks. So stillbirths are just um, horrible for women and, and families to live through. Um, you know, we try to avoid a stillbirth at, at all costs. Um, but 16% of these women with really active lupus had a stillbirth, which is just astronomically high. A preterm birth, meaning a delivery more than three weeks before the due date, happened in about two thirds of the pregnancies uh, with women with really active disease. And so only 13, if you had really active disease in pregnancy, only 13% actually delivered a live, healthy, full term um, infant. So, uh, what we find is with other diseases, um, vasculitis, for example, um, the, there's not enough numbers to show us exactly this data, but I suspect it would look very similar. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, not to this extreme. Severe rheumatoid arthritis does not increase your risk for stillbirths, but it does increase your risk for preterm births. Um, Active inflammatory bowel disease, so active Crohn's disease or really active ulcerative colitis, will have numbers similar to lupus with high rates of pregnancy loss and very high rates of preterm birth. So, um, so letting really active disease go on is, is very problematic. Um, sort of getting to what I was just saying, there are some parts of, of autoimmune diseases that are more damaging than others when it comes to pregnancy concerns. So higher risk um, issues are, are ones that are affecting your internal organs. So if you have really active lupus in your kidneys um, or you have sarcoidosis in your heart or your lungs or you have inflammatory bowel disease and your gut is really active with inflammation, um, if you have really active uh, inflammation in your brain um, or if you've ever had any blood clots, um, and been put on blood thinners for a long period of time. Those are all things that really significantly impact the risk of pregnancy um, for both you as the pregnant woman and for your fetus. And when I say um, having active heart disease or having a history of heart disease, for example, from your autoimmune disease puts you at risk, what I mean is it puts you at risk for having your heart not work well when you're pregnant. Um, which could put you in the hospital unable to breathe that potentially uh, risk your life. Um, and if your heart's not working well, it's hard to keep a placenta going and it's hard to keep the pregnancy intact all the way through to the end and could easily lead to a very early delivery. So these are the issues that um, if you've had things on that higher risk issues in the past, um, but they're quiet now, good, that's definitely better. <laughs> Um, but definitely talk with your doctor before you get pregnant. Those are, if you've had those things, you definitely need to make sure your pregnant, your doctor is all on board with you getting pregnant before you get pregnant. If you have active inflammation in any of those areas now, then now is not a good time to get pregnant and you need to work with your doctor to get that disease under good control before you get ready to get pregnant. On the lower risk side, however, I would put joint pain, um, fatigue, rashes, these are all things that certainly make you miserable and certainly make pregnancy feel very long, but um, they have much less impact on your safety, your own personal safety during pregnancy, and less impact on the pregnancy. So we don't see as much um, it, it, you know, fatigue, joint pain, rashes doesn't, don't cause pregnancy losses. Those things don't cause pregnancy loss. Um, and they don't cause really, really early deliveries. They may make your baby get delivered a couple weeks early, but not a couple months early kind of thing, which is the things on the higher risk issues list could easily make your baby have to get delivered a couple months early. So, so we really think of the disease activities um, as kind of different. And so you can think about the, your own experience with your disease and, and where that puts you on your risk profile. 
this is a brief advertisement <laughs> for any of you who are listening who might happen to have vasculitis or inflammation in your blood vessels. If you have vasculitis, you know you have vasculitis. If you're not sure that you have vasculitis, then to be honest, you probably don't have vasculitis. Um, this is different than rheumatoid arthritis. It's different than multiple sclerosis or inflammatory bowel disease. Vasculitis is a pretty rare autoimmune problem with inflammation in the blood vessels. Um, it's so rare that we actually are doing an online um, study in order to try to hunt down as many patients as possible with these diseases who are pregnant um, and enroll them so that we can actually understand more about them. So if you have vasculitis and you're pregnant now, please uh, go to this website and join us. If you have vasculitis and think you might get pregnant in the future, go stick this in the front of your uh, pregnancy book so that when you get pregnant, you can, um, you can dial us in. So next we're gonna talk about birth control. So um, one thing it's worth knowing is that not all birth control methods and not all contraceptives are equally effective. So um, I'm gonna see if I can go to this website. Uh, oh, I did it. This is my favorite thing to Google. So this was a, a magazine article actually in the New York Times about whether your birth control will work or not for you. And it's a great website that you can spend a little time on. Um, I just Google New York Times birth control usually, and um, it will show you how effective your birth control is. So for example, if you come over here to the condoms, if you're, and you and your partner are just using condoms for your birth control, and that's your plan for uh, four years, that's all you're gonna do, then, um, you have a 55% chance or 55 out of 100 people like you will be pregnant at the end of four years, which is a very high number. I think that tells you that condoms are, are not nearly as effective as we want them to be. If you take uh, the birth control pills and do that for four years in a row, um, still 31 out of 100 women will be pregnant at the end of that, of that period. And that's because both of those, both condoms and birth control pills um, you actually have to do something in order to have them work, right? So condoms, you have to use them every single time. You have to use them properly. They can't break, all that sort of stuff. Um, birth control pills, you need to take it every single day. You can see on this little dotted line at the bottom, that's what we call perfect use. That's if, you know, they force feed you a birth control pill every single day for four years so you never, ever miss it. Then it's very effective. 1% will be pregnant. But this is what actually the general population does is th the way that the, rest, the the way that most of us take our birth control pills is that 31 out of 100 might be pregnant at the end of four years. The good news is that down here, if you really need to not get pregnant, if you're taking medications, which we're about to talk about that cause birth defects, if your disease is really active, or if you just really don't want to have more kids, at the, you know, after you have your next one, you're done. There are some really great options down here that. Um, cause uh, that, that really make it very hard to get pregnant. So the IUD, for example, um, which is a little contraption they, they just put into your uterus and can stay there for five years, very rare that people get pregnant. Uh, you get your tubes tied, also three out of 100 get pregnant. Uh, your husband uh, finally chips in and gets a vasectomy, very effective, very few people get pregnant. So there's lots of different contraceptive options um, some are very effective, some not nearly as effective as you might have otherwise thought. Um, and so it's worth uh, thinking about what your pregnancy goals are and um, uh, what would be effective for you. Where's my slides? Hang on a second, let me find the right slide deck. There it is. Um, I will add as well that basically all of those birth control methods that I just showed you um, are available and safe to basically all women with autoimmune diseases um, with one exception. And that is women who've had a blood clot in the past um, or who are at very high risk of having a blood clot should not use estrogen in their birth control. But the good news is that most of those birth control methods do not use estrogen. The only ones with estrogen really are birth control pills and the patch. Everything else does not have, uh, have estrogen. So um, every once in a while I'll see somebody who said that their doctor said they couldn't get estrogen so they couldn't use birth control. 
And that is not true. <laughs> Uh, there are lots of good birth control options um, that uh, do not have estrogen. All right, um, a little bit of data from um, the questionnaire that we sent out. Um, so we actually had some patients working with us um, and they wanted to uh, know um, the impact of the menstrual cycle and birth control pills on arthritis disease activity. So they said that um, a lot of women seem to feel like um, arthritis, uh, their arthritis got worse with their menstrual cycle and that birth control pills could make their arthritis worse. So we asked all the women uh, what they had found. So we asked them first about their menstrual cycle. And as you can see on this slide, half of the women said um, they had no change in their menstrual cycle whatsoever um, with their arthritis. Their arthritis was the same all month, it didn't change. But half of them said that indeed, when they had their period, so the period, usually the sort of premenstrual or you know right around the time of their period, the first couple of days before it or during their period, um, their arthritis got worse. And a few people said that that was actually the best time for them, but that was that was quite rare. So most people, so half no change, but then most everybody else felt that their arthritis got worse with their menstrual cycle. Um, I, as a physician, I'll tell you, I found that interesting. That is not something that I um, ask women about. Uh, so when they come in and I ask how they're doing today, um, I don't ask them if they're having their period and do you think this will just get better in a few days? Um, so uh, I think it's an interesting uh, finding. Um, then we asked them um, what they thought birth control pills did for them. So um, this was only women who um, said that they uh, took birth control pills at some point after their arthritis diagnosis. So the first question was, did you, did you, wanna, did you notice that the birth control pills had any impact on your arthritis? Um, and 70% said that they noticed no difference, that the birth control pills had no, made no difference on their arthritis. 12% didn't know, which I assume kind of means the same as no impact because they couldn't tell us one of the other two. 10% said their arthritis worsened, and 9% actually said their arthritis improved. So the way I interpret this data personally, and I would love to hear, uh, you can write in if you interpret it differently, is that birth control pills really don't appear to have a major impact on um, arthritis um, and the arthritis that the women in the study experienced. Um, but perhaps the women for whom the birth control pills made their arthritis worse, might be louder on social media than other people. One of the interesting things that we found was that um, quite a few of those patients in that improved arthritis group um, were in this group uh, that said their menstrual cycle made their periods or made their arthritis worse. And then they said that what they figured out with their doctor is they just took what we call continuous birth control pills. So that instead of having a period every single month, they actually would just take their birth control pills for three months or sometimes even just take them all the time. So they wouldn't have a period. So they didn't have to go through that arthritis flare every month when they had their period. So that's actually how their arthritis improved their, or the birth control pills improved their arthritis is that it actually just made it so they didn't have periods. So, which I thought was pretty clever, um, a pretty clever way around that. So. Um, the last thing about birth control um, is emergency contraception. And I think that this is, um, emergency contraception is something a lot of doctors don't really know very much about. So if you were to ask your rheumatologist, you might not get great information from them about this. But um, I think it's something that all women should know about. So emergency contraception um, is basically high dose progesterone birth control pills. Um, it does not cause an abortion. If you um, already have a sperm and an egg that have met and implanted, it will stay there. It will not take them away because actually high dose, high progesterone levels are what happens when you um, get pregnant. So it will not cause an abortion. Um, and it is totally different than the abortion pill, totally different thing. What it does is it um, prevents you from ovulating. So if you haven't ovulated yet, if you had unprotected sex, you haven't ovulated yet, it keeps the egg intact and so it doesn't come out. If it has already come out, it also helps by making it harder for the sperm to swim. So the sperm can't swim very well to get up to the egg and it slows the egg coming out towards the uterus. So it basically just keeps the egg and the sperm apart. 
So it uh, dramatically decreases your chances of getting pregnant um, if you had unprotected sex. Um, there's actually only 1% chance of getting pregnant if you took it within, take it within 72 hours of unprotected intercourse. And the sooner you take it after having unprotected sex, the better uh, in terms of effectiveness. So all across the country, you can just buy this over the counter without a prescription um, at any time. You don't have to be of a certain age. You do not need to show your insurance card. You don't need to show them your ID. You can just buy it. You might have to actually talk to the pharmacist if it's not out on the counter, out on the shelves. Um, but if you have unprotected sex by accident, if the condom breaks, if something happens bad at a party that you didn't want to have sex, but you did anyway, um, emergency contraception is an option. Um, it should be safe for basically all women with um, autoimmune diseases. Um, if you're at high risk for having blood clots, it's only progesterone, so it should not dramatically increase your risk for blood clots, and it certainly won't increase your risk for blood clots as much as being pregnant. So if your doctor has told you that you really shouldn't be pregnant now because of your medicines or your illness, um, emergency contraception should be a reasonable choice for you, and you can buy it over the counter. All right, shifting gears, we're going to talk about medications and pregnancy. So on our survey, um, we asked women, uh, there, it turned out there were 68 women in the survey who had had a pregnancy since their diagnosis of arthritis. Um, and of those, 71% said they were very worried about the impact of their medications on pregnancy. <laughs> Interestingly, we actually asked the same question of men. Very few men answered the survey, so we're not showing that those results. And um, very few were worried <laughs> about the medications and the impact on pregnancy. So, but women were certainly worried and we understand that. So um, an important thing to know, you know, to sort of cut through a lot of the clutter about medications. So of the rheumatologic medications, so the medicines that we use for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and other diseases like that, um, as well as actually for in, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, these, we all use the same drugs. There's really three main medications that have actually been shown to cause birth defects. Only three. All right, not that many, just three. So methotrexate is number one, is certainly one of them. Mycophenolate, also called Celsept, is one we use it a lot for people with kidney disease from lupus or vasculitis, things like that. Um, and cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide is a chemotherapy medication that we use for really severe um, rheumatolo uh, rheumatologic diseases. So we don't use mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide very often at all for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, not very often for inflammatory bowel disease. They're really more for people with kidney disease is really where we use it more. So methotrexate, however, might be a more common um, drug among those of you who are, are listening. Um, I will add there's a couple others that also can cause birth defects, though they're used not really as rheumatologic, at least the ACE inhibitors, those are blood pressure medications. Um, thalidomide and Revlimid are two medicines we use rarely for lupus skin disease, but are very, cause a lot of birth defects. See, there's lots of hoops you have to jump through for those two medicines to get them. So these rheumatic triatogens, these three drugs, they increase the risk of birth defects. So um, when we, they do studies, they basically collect women who, have, um, who are pregnant and then they follow them uh, through their pregnancy. And, and then these groups actually send a doctor to, to study the baby and make sure that they know if the baby has birth defects or not. When you do that with just a general population of, pe of pregnant women, about 3% of the, of the babies will have a birth defect. That's just, and that's just the rate across the world is about 3%, 3 3 out of 100 of all babies have a birth defect without any clear reason for that. Um, if you look at women with an autoimmune disease, the risk is about 3.6, which when we do statistics, that's really just about the same, no different really. If you look at women who took methotrexate prior to pregnancy, but stopped it even just as close as like a week, but they, they took it within the three months before pregnancy, they took in that period, but they stopped it and they didn't actually take it in pregnancy. There's also actually no increase in um, birth defects in that group. When you look at women who took methotrexate during pregnancy by accident, like they didn't know they were pregnant and kept taking their methotrexate and then found out they were pregnant, that's the most common way that happens. Um, the 
birth defect rate was about six and a half to seven percent, which is about twice the rate in the general population. When I show this data to doctors, um, which I show this data to rheumatologists a lot, um, I think they're generally a little surprised that methotrexate rate um, isn't higher than that. So we are all trained to be terrified of methotrexate in pregnancy, and all rheumatologists will list that number one as the as the medicine that causes birth defects. But it it really only doubles the risk to about six and a half. Certainly, that's higher than you'd like it to be. Um, but it's not like half of the babies have a major birth defect, right? 90% of the babies don't have a birth defect. So um, that's the methotrexate. So you certainly don't want to get pregnant on it if you can avoid it. If you do, it's, it might not be a, a huge problem. Cellcept uh, or mycophenolate and the cyclophosphamide, these are those two medicines we use for really severe disease. Both have much higher rates of birth defects. So up to one out of four babies that are born alive will have a birth defect. And leflutamide or Areva um, actually doesn't appear to increase birth defects as long as you give the woman um, a medicine that clears out the drug right after she gets pregnant. All these medicines increase the risk of birth defects like this. The other thing that they all do is they double the risk for pregnancy, pregnancy loss at least. So basically for methotrexate, for mycophenolate, and for cyclophosphamide, all of them have a pregnancy loss rate around 40%. So the general population, we expect the pregnancy loss rate to be somewhere around 15% or so. But if you have been taking one of these medicines when you get pregnant, you have about a 40% chance of having a pregnancy loss, which is very high. Um, and sometimes those losses are very early in pregnancy, a couple weeks in, and sometimes they're further along. So what drugs can be used in pregnancy? Um, I think. It, the way I teach it to, to doctors is really kind of most of the other older medicines are okay. So hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil um, and chloroquine are both okay. Um, azathioprine, also called Imuran, um, is fine. Tacrolimus and cyclosporin are both good medicines in pregnancy. Um, the azathioprine, the tacrolimus, and the cyclosporin have very nice safety data from women with inflammatory bowel disease showing good safety without birth defects and without um, major complications. Um, and also from women who've had a kidney transplant. So if a woman has had a kidney transplant, she can't just stop all of her medicines while she's pregnant because she'll reject her kidney. So she often has to stay on some combination of these medicines on this page um, and can do so very safely. Um, IVIG is an infusion that we occasionally use. It costs a fortune, but it's safe. Um, corticosteroids or prednisone or steroids um, are also considered fairly safe. Uh, I try to keep the dose of those as low as possible, um, but we can use them if necessary in pregnancy. So biologics, so these are all those new medications that people are injecting into themselves that have come out on the market in the last 10 to 15 um, years or so. Um, so biologics, uh, we have very nice data for some of them and very little data for others. So the first thing to know is that these biologics are really big molecules. So when you take like methotrexate, it's like a tiny small little molecule that can just jump right across the um, placenta. Um, but these are huge molecules, so they can't just jump right in across the placenta. Um, they're really big. So they actually don't cross over the placenta and don't cross into the fetus in the first half of pregnancy. But in the second half of pregnancy, um, these biologics, almost all of our biologics are antibodies and they do cross. Um, so if you're taking something like adalimumab or Humira, um, we know that it will uh, start crossing sometime in the second half of pregnancy. And actually if we measure the mom's level and the baby's level on the day of delivery, that the baby will actually have more Humira in their system, a concentration, higher concentration of Humira than the mom will. One exception to that is Simsia or Sertilizumab. It is a big, huge molecule, but it's a different shape, so it actually doesn't get dragged um, across to the fetus. There's now nice data from about 25 pregnancies that shows uh, little to basically no transfer um, across to the baby. So sometimes we use that preferentially in pregnancy, but really um, it doesn't have to be uh, that one. 
for the TNF inhibitors like Humira, um, which is Adalimumab, um, Infliximab, which is Remicade, um, we have good safety data showing that those work well for women with inflammatory bowel disease as well as arthritis. And so um, if you are doing well on Humira, for example, um, then continuing it in pregnancy would be fine. If you used to do well on Humira but are not doing so well anymore and you need to switch and you're hoping that something might work better, then Simsia might be a good choice at that point. For biologics beyond these original TNF inhibitors, um, there's very little data. Um, so uh, I can't make any kind of blanket statement at all about how about their safety. And what you should do if you're if you've moved past medicines like Humira um, and have moved on to different types of biologics, and you want to get pregnant, I would talk to your doctor really carefully about. Um, are there medications other than these new biologics that will control your disease? Could you go back to Humira? Could you try Simsia um, if you haven't been on that one before um, and see if that works well enough to control your disease during pregnancy so that you don't have to be the person who's going to test out whether these biologics um, are safe in pregnancy? If that's really not an option for you, if there's no way to control your disease with anything but a new biologic, then you just have to really think through the um, your sort of how you're going to weigh those risks and, and benefits and maybe use it as little as possible, something like that. But um, there are some groups who are being more aggressive about trying new biologics. Others are less aggressive. So you'll have to do a lot more research and thinking about that. Mother to Baby is a great place to do some of that thinking. Mother to Baby is a website um, and where they have great information. This is, a, this is their opening page. Um, you can, um, they have great uh, sort of patient printouts or handouts that you can read about your different medications or diseases in pregnancy. You can actually call them. It looks like you can actually live chat them as well on your computer um, and email them, but they actually have uh, people who are sitting at phone banks ready to talk to women who are newly pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant or have been pregnant for a long time who have been exposed to anything if you work in a factory and get exposed to some strange chemical and you're pregnant, this is who you would call. You call these folks at Mother to Baby and say, this is what happened. What do we do now? Um, if you are taking some medication and you find out you're pregnant and you're worried about the impact of that pregnancy, call these folks. Mother to Baby will help you understand what we know about the drug and help you make a decision about what to do from there. In addition to all that, they actually are collecting information from everybody who calls and we'll, we'll ask people to participate in studies. So this is how we actually get data um, on the safety of methotrexate and how many patients have birth defects with methotrexate, for example, is from this group and others just like it in Europe. That if you call and say, oh my goodness, I just got pregnant, I was taking methotrexate, they talk you through what the risks are and, and so on, but they also might invite you to be in a study. Um, in that study, they'll call you a couple times in pregnancy to find out what medicines you've taken, and then they actually will send, fly a doctor out to, to examine your baby to figure out um, if there's any birth effects from there. And that's really paying it forward. That's how women in the future will know about the safety of, for, for, for example, all these new biologics. If you get pregnant on purpose or by accident on one of these newer medications, please call them. That's how other women will finally know whether or not these are safe and be able to make a better decision five, 10 years down the road. All right, I think the last section I have prepared is for breastfeeding. So um, in our survey, we asked women about balancing breastfeeding and medications. Um, and what we found was that 78% reported that they avoided taking arthritis medications in order to breastfeed. And 54% reported stopping breastfeeding in order to take medications. So these are some of the quotes that people wrote in, um, which were, really heartbreaking actually. Um, I decided it would be better for my baby to be able to hold her than to be breastfed. I breastfed as long as I could using medications that were considered moderately safe, but when I got to the point that my RA was so bad that I could barely hold my baby, I knew I needed stronger RA medications and I reluctantly weaned. For the first six months, I flared while breastfeeding and I would have my spouse hold the baby up to my breast to breastfeed. I was in bed for six months. 
So these are heartbreaking to me for multiple reasons. <laughs> One is because you could really just imagine uh, what these women uh, lived through and the pain and the uh, both emotional and physical suffering that they had. But also because um, I suspect that this was not necessary and uh, that these women could have taken medications to control their RA while they breastfed. So we asked women um, as well about what medicines they took. Um, 37 women who breastfed um, an infant after having arthritis told us uh, that they took these medicines. So prednisone was the most common. Only 14% took a TNF inhibitor. Um, and you can see uh, some really low numbers for, for other medications. So almost all of our immunosuppressant medications that we use for autoimmune diseases are compatible with breastfeeding. Um, when people do studies to see how much drug goes from the mother into breast milk into the baby, um, we present that as a, a percentage so that the, the baby gets what percentage of a dose um, through breast milk. So if you look at azathioprine or Imuran, the baby gets well less than 1%. TNF inhibitors, it's well less than 0.5%. And to be honest, it's, it should be basically nothing. These are huge, huge molecules, these biologics, and they just really don't, they're too big to transfer into breast milk. So the baby really isn't gonna be significantly exposed to these medications. In addition, all these biologics, you aren't drinking them, right? Because your stomach will digest them. You're injecting them to avoid the drug going through your stomach. So a baby who's drinking them in, um, it probably won't make a big difference to them. Methotrexate, the medicine that we certainly don't want you taking when you're pregnant, actually very little of it probably transfers into breast milk. Um, so I'm actually currently letting women breastfeed six days a week and then we dump the, med the, the breast milk from the day they take methotrexate. Methotrexate's a once a week medicine so you can get away with that. Ibuprofen or Advil is a very safe medication when you're breastfeeding. I have arthritis myself and I took my own ibuprofen to the hospital when I gave birth so I could start it uh, the second the baby was out um, and breastfed on it uh, for well over a year if you combine my two babies. Hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil, very little transfer uh, to the baby. So the baby would be getting like half of a milligram at most of, uh, of, of, of hydroxychloroquine um, uh, if, if they were actually like licking a pill, which they're not doing. And if they just drink your breast milk, they hardly get any hydroxychloroquine. Prednisone also very low levels and sulfasalazine also low levels. The only medicines that we really don't put on the list of, of compatible with breastfeeding are really because we just don't actually have data so all the other biologics beyond TNF inhibitors, there really is no data available about how they transfer into breast milk, but they really probably don't transfer into breast milk in any kind of sizable amount. Mycophenolate, leflutamide, and cyclophosphamide, there's really no data um, on them and they might be risky, so we don't use them. But, um, but really, basically, almost all of our medications are compatible with breastfeeding. Um, if you need a good place to go to get information or your doctor is hemming and hawing and, and nervous about giving you an answer, a great place to go is called um, uh, Lact Med, and it is a clearinghouse for all of this data. It's written really kind of more for a medical person uh, than a patient, though there's also sections on there where the patients can, you can easily read and figure out what they're talking about. Um, so this is a great place to go, and you could even, you know, go there and print out your medicines and take it into your doctor make them read it and make a decision with you um, about breastfeeding and your medicines. So um, I hate it when people tell me that they weaned and then they show up to me, they weaned because they thought they couldn't take any medicines um, because that's just not true. So I'm gonna stop here and we're gonna see if there's any questions. I know Shilpa has been collecting them as people have been writing them in and so she's gonna read me and then I, oh. I do have some prepared, so. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is just great information, really relevant for, for all of us. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Uh, so we do have quite a few questions. Uh, we'll try and answer as many as we can, but I, I'm also sort of 
uh, cognizant about the time here. So let me start with uh, one question that we, we got quite early on in the webinar. Um, and the, this person asks, what, what might happen to my baby in the first year of life if I take an anti, um, sorry, if I take a TNF inhibitor of salpicilazine in pregnancy? Mm, that's a great question. So, um, so there is a little bit of data um, to tell us about what happens to the babies in the first year of life. Uh, there's a study um, going on with the inflammatory bowel disease uh, patients um, that is following the babies uh, in the first year of life. And, and what they found is that babies exposed to TNF inhibitors uh, do not have an increased risk for infection in the first year of life, which is great news um, and certainly was our primary concern. But in terms of other kind of long-term um, impacts of your rheumatic disease or your medications on offspring, um, it's really hard to get data. You know, it's a, those are very expensive studies uh, to do to collect women and then also collect their babies and follow and follow and follow and follow over a long period of time. So uh, one of the areas I think that needs more research is is definitely this: what happens to the offspring. Um, and I think there's a lot of different ways um, that we could target that. Hopefully, by in the future with research projects, for example, looking at uh, big, big data sets that are now available of women who are pregnant. Um, and then we can, we can actually um, see when a woman has rheumatoid arthritis, for example, taking them at a specific medicine, we can find when she has a baby and then we can actually find who that baby is in her health records, for example, and then um, able to follow that baby and see if the baby gets admitted to the hospital or see if the baby gets diagnosed with any specific illnesses or ever gets a, an, an autoimmune disease themselves or, or, what, or whatever. So um, I think there are some areas for future research there, but unfortunately um, we don't know really long-term what happens to kids um, exposed to either autoimmune diseases in their mom or, or the medications. We don't have as much information as we'd like. Okay, so we have uh, another question on Cumella. Um, this person is asking if you could talk a little bit about the safety of Humira while pregnant, um, because yeah. in case patients need to take, take it while they are pregnant, <clears throat> mm -hmm. if, if you could respond sure. to that. So Humira, um, so Humira has been shown to be uh, quite safe in pregnancy. There are several um, places where we're getting data for that. One is from the um, the big mother to baby. A study where they have been following uh, pregnant women who took Humira at some point during pregnancy. Some of them took it all pregnancy, some just took it at the beginning, um, and then um, evaluated the, um, the children for birth defects and did not find any increase in birth defects. Um, also, there is nice data coming out of um, studies for women with inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis that really show good safety with uh, Humira and other medications like it, in, including uh, Remicade or uh, Simzia, um, showing that uh, the offspring are healthy, that they don't have an increased risk for infections, um, and that uh, that they are no, like, no more likely to be preterm than a baby that was not exposed to those uh, medications. So Humira is felt to be uh, quite safe in pregnancy. We often will stop it around 32 weeks or so of pregnancy. That's because we do know that Humira crosses the placenta quite well, particularly at the very end of pregnancy. So um, actually, if you were to draw blood samples on the, the mother and the baby at the time of delivery, the baby would have more than the mother. So we often will stop the Humira about eight weeks before delivery or so, so that there's less in the mother's circulation and therefore less in the baby. And that would, in, in theory, decrease the risk for infection. Wonderful. Thank you. And presumably um, these... Uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I have one more, one more comment on that, and that is that Humira is also um, felt to be safe with breastfeeding. And um, so what I usually do is when I have somebody stop it at 32 weeks or so, um, I usually have them start it one or two weeks after delivery um, so that they get right back on it so that they don't um, experience any kind of increase in their 
um, arthritis or ulcerative colitis um, in the weeks after delivery. It's very common that women will have a flare after they deliver, but as long as we get medication started really quickly after delivery, that flare is much less common and much less severe. Great. Thanks, Megan. And I, I was just, yes, I was just uh, also going to say, uh, you know, these are also questions that patients can, at the time of, uh, if, if these are concerns that patients are having, these are good questions to ask, uh, sort of a shared decision making uh, with the doctor. These are, these are exactly the kind of questions that doctors might be looking um, to from patients. Absolutely. This is, a, this is definitely the kind of stuff to talk with your doctor and to talk with your rheumatologist or gastroenterologist, um, also talk with a high-risk obstetrician. Um, but not all doctors are um, as up on the um, current data as others, so you might not really be getting the same story from, from all doctors. So it, there, there are places you can go to get really good information, including the mother-to-baby website, um, that you can even just bring into your doctor um, in order to really have a, a good, accurate conversation about this stuff. Great, thanks. Um, so a few more questions. The next question is um, about the correlation with the MDHFR mutation and autoimmune uh, conditions. So if you could talk first a little bit about the, what the mutation itself is about for people in the sure. uh, listening. Sure. So MTHFR is a mutation. Um, it's not an autoimmune process. It's a mutation in how you metabolize folic acid in your body. Um, and it, it doesn't really have any correlation, as far as I'm aware, to autoimmune disease. Um, it is present in a small percentage of all people um, across the globe. And um, so certainly some people with autoimmune conditions do have it. Um, there was a lot of concern that it might be associated with uh, pregnancy loss, so my understanding is that that is uh, less of an association. Um, if you do have MTHFR mutation, um, then the treatment is basically taking uh, B vitamins and folic acid in order to help overcome the uh, mutation uh, problem, um, and then that should really fix any kind of, uh, of issues with it. Great. Um, the next question we have is, uh, is actually a very specific question. Um, so, and I'll, I'll just read it out. It says, I have autonomic dysfunction and have had serious injuries from passing out in the past. Is there anything I can expect going into pregnancy or anything I can do to improve this condition? Mm -hmm. So that is a really specific question, and I can't give you specific medical advice on that. You'll need to talk with your um, clinicians who are managing the autonomic dysfunction, um, whether that's a neurologist or cardiologist or whomever that is. Um, uh, but it is worth noting that um, many, many women, um, even without autonomic dysfunction, have lightheadedness and will sometimes faint during pregnancy. Um, that's not that uncommon. You know, you're, you're basically adding a whole extra person on top of you and having to share your blood. And your body is made so that if um, there's any kind of uh, dehydration or slow heartbeat or anything like that that makes it so that the baby might not get enough blood, uh, your body will give blood to the baby instead of to you, and that can make it so you don't get quite enough blood flow to your head and feel really lightheaded and so on. So it's important that all pregnant women stay really well hydrated, make sure that they eat every day, um, particularly in the morning, um, in order to um, avoid that uh, passing out or, um, or the, the passing out uh, sensation. If you're having that sensation a little bit, then sit down, drink some water, and um, it should go away. If it happens more, um, or if it's uh, if it's not going away, um, then you should definitely see your doctor about that. Okay. Um, there uh, are a few questions we have about safe options as far as painkillers are concerned uh, while pregnant. Could you talk a little bit to that? Sure. So, um, so pain management does get a little bit more complicated when you are pregnant. Um, so the safest medication for pain is considered Tylenol. Um, as I think most women with autoimmune disease and inflammatory arthritis in particular will know that um, 
that uh, Tylenol is not the most effective pain medication, but I think um, often it's worth a try because sometimes it's better than you, uh, it's better than nothing, basically. Um, there are some times in pregnancy, particularly sort of right in the middle of the pregnancy, early middle pregnancy, that you can take ibuprofen, um, but you need to definitely clear that with your obstetrician. Different obstetricians have different viewpoints. Um, on that, there's not really specific guidelines, but that sometimes is an option to take sort of occasional or low-dose um, ibuprofen for some women, um, but some obstetricians are really quite opposed to that. Um, otherwise, um, uh, we certainly don't like women taking high-dose narcotics during pregnancy, but an occasional low-dose narcotic um, is not uh, the end of the world. Uh, and um, if you're just having intense, uh, severe pain that uh, comes on sometimes, then um, taking uh, a tablet of hydrocodone or oxycodone um, periodically might not be a terrible idea, um, but you should definitely talk with your doctors about the risks of that, um, as well as the potential benefits for how you're feeling. Um, otherwise, um, pregnancy is a good time to work on um, alternative pain management strategies. So um, a good place to start for that actually is even just looking at the literature and books and videos and so on on natural, ch natural childbirth. Um, because uh, if you think um, inflammatory arthritis is painful, natural childbirth um, really hurts a lot. Um, of course, it's for a much shorter period of time, but women have over, um, over the millennia have come up with um, approaches, mental approaches, um, and other things to really help get them through um, that expected excruciating pain. And I think that some of those kind of holistic approaches um, could potentially be helpful to women living in more chronic pain from an inflammatory arthritis or other autoimmune process. So that's not to say that that's the answer and that that's going to take care of all of your pain. However, um, it might make your pain certainly more livable when you're pregnant and hopefully actually even more livable after you're pregnant if you, if you can really learn some of the techniques that people use um, to help manage uh, pain uh, from the mental side. Um, otherwise, uh, sometimes things like topical treatments, so um, topical ointments like Bengay or Voltaren gel really have very minimal amounts of medication that get into your bloodstream, so that might be a reasonable option. Um, one of my favorites is Salon Paws, which are these stickers that you can just buy at the pharmacy that actually have a little bit of ibuprofen type medication in them. Again, very little gets into your bloodstream, so that might be um, another reasonable option. Heat is a good option. They don't want you to put a heating pad on your pregnant belly, but heat on your um, painful joints might be also be um, a reasonable approach. Wonderful. Thank you for laying out all those options. We have a question. This is a two-part question from Amy in the audience, um, who asks if it is harder to become pregnant, to conceive with an autoimmune disease, and if in, if in fact that is true, if IVF then is a safe option. Mm -hmm. Good question. So the first one in terms of infertility, um, it kind of depends on the disease. So it appears that um, women with rheumatoid arthritis might have a harder time conceiving uh, than the general population. Um, uh, we've done a couple of studies showing um, high rates of infertility in women with rheumatoid arthritis, but we've also done other studies with different populations of women with rheumatoid arthritis that didn't show increased risk. Um, so that's a little bit up in the air, but we've known for decades that women with rheumatoid arthritis have fewer children than other women, um, and uh, some of that probably is a personal choice, but some of that is also probably infertility. Um, women with lupus, we don't really think of a strong association with infertility for women with lupus. Um, I can't, I can't think of the last time that I had a lupus patient need to work with the folks in the infertility clinic um, in order to get pregnant. If anything, our, our lupus patients seem to be um, almost extra fertile. So, um, so it really kind of depends on your disease. Um, uh, celiac disease is something that can be associated with infertility, particularly, um, really mostly it's undiagnosed celiac disease. So women who don't know they have celiac and so are continuing to eat gluten, um, which is continuing their celiac inflammatory condition to go on. Those women are at higher risk of infertility. So women who are 
on the celiac diet, that risk of infertility appears to decrease um, pretty close back to the general population. So, uh, so infertility varies, is somewhat variable. Um, in terms of treatment, we really think of treatment for um, infertility in women with autoimmune disease um, is similar to women without autoimmune disease. The only really women, I think, who need to change up the therapy from just the standard stuff that they do for everybody else is women who are at high risk for blood clots. So women with lupus, um, maybe with vasculitis, if you've had a prior history of a blood clot, then the high level of estrogen that happens during an IVF cycle, for example, um, could be potentially risky to you. So sometimes um, infertility doctors around me will use a lower estrogen protocol similar to what they use for breast cancer patients. Um, alternatively, some doctors will uh, treat women at high risk for blood clots with uh, Lovenox or blood thinners uh, during the IVF cycle. So, um, but otherwise, all the rest of the therapies really are thought to be quite safe and, um, and you can go through their usual protocols um, without too much concern. I would definitely, however, make sure that your um, fertility doctor knows about your autoimmune condition that your rheumatologist or whoever is managing your autoimmune condition knows that you're going through fertility treatment so that the doctors can share notes and make sure that they're all on the same page. Okay, thanks, Megan. Um, another question from Jody, who asks, in addition to the risks that come along with older age of conception itself, are there other risks that women need to be aware of um, mm -hmm. with advanced maternal age conception and methotrexate or biologic use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, so women who are, who are advanced maternal age, which um, I, I hate to say this as a, as a woman physician who didn't have her babies until her mid-30s, um, actually start somewhere between the age of 30 and 35. Um, well, that's when... Uh, conceptions, it starts getting harder to get pregnant when you're in your 30s, um, and pregnancy outcomes, um, particularly as you get into the late 30s, can um, start looking a little bit worse with more preterm birth and more uh, birth effects and genetic mutations. So, um, so advanced maternal age is um, similar, I would say, for women with and without um, autoimmune diseases. I think that... Um, there's not really a, per, a particular difference there. The advanced maternal age just adds the same amount of risk no matter what your autoimmune process is or, or not. Um, the other question is about methotrexate. Um, we definitely do not recommend getting pregnant on methotrexate. Um, it has uh, been shown to, to increase the pregnancy loss rate by about two, so about 40% of uh, conceptions on methotrexate will uh, end in a pregnancy loss. Um, and uh, of those that are born alive, up, up to up to 10% have a birth defect. Um, so we definitely recommend not taking methotrexate when you're trying to conceive. Um, and uh, if you have unprotected sex while taking methotrexate, I recommend taking emergency contraception or Plan B, which you can buy over the pharmacy from the pharmacy. Um, and that change, that risk doesn't really change for older uh, women or not. That, that's our recommendation for all women. The okay. last question was about biologics, and I think I've probably addressed that pretty well. I wouldn't change the risk factors for biologics based on maternal age either. Okay, great. Um, Lucy asks if there is any data uh, available or any research, uh, current research available on the links between autism to medication or autoimmune disease? The link between what? Autism, sorry. And autism. Oh, autism. And autism. Yeah, so yeah. there is, um, so there's a little bit of data suggesting that women with lupus, uh, that their children might have a slight increased risk for autism. Um, it is not clear whether that's related to medication or to the disease. The study um, that was that that was done and did not really know what medications the mother was taking, just knew that she had a diagnosis of lupus. Um, so we, we don't know that at this point. Um, I think that uh, 
the increased risk for autism is, is pretty small in lupus populations and, and as well as in, and, and it really hasn't been well demonstrated at all in, in other um, populations. So um, I don't think that um, the, we all worry about autism. Um, I think that the, the link is, is not strong between um, autoimmune diseases and that condition, unfortunately. Okay, great. Um, we have another question uh, from Kelsey, who I guess related to the first question, who asks if there's any research that indicates that symptoms tend to worsen um, and that different medications may be needed to control disease post-pregnancy. And she she sort of specifies she's not just talking about uh, you know post-pregnancy flare, but uh, over a longer term. So. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any indications or research that's available yeah. to suggest that we might need that different medications for that period? Absolutely. So, um, so it, it varies by disease. Um, it uh, so for patients with rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis, those are sort of the two that that everybody talks about in that. Um, those two diseases tend to improve to some extent in pregnancy. I was actually just reading a brand new study on this today um, that showed that about half of patients with rheumatoid arthritis actually get better while they're pregnant. Um, but then also about half of those patients will get worse after they deliver. So rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis, both very well known for having what we call a postpartum flare in which the disease worsens and um, in my experience, it's usually about two to four months after um, delivery. So you, you have a couple weeks without a flare and then things sort of start getting more active again. Um, in my experience, when we look at, at women with lupus, we don't really see a big postpartum flare in a lot of women. A lot of women with lupus do feel better when they're pregnant. They have less achiness, just like the RA patients have less achiness and pain. Um, and that comes back but it kind of just goes back to their baseline. It's not like a flare. I don't think it's just sort of what they always lived with before they were pregnant. Um, in the long term, uh, we don't really think that there's a significant difference in long-term disease for women who've had a baby and have not had a baby. So for women with rheumatoid arthritis, for example, um, there actually was a study done maybe 20 or 30 years ago that compared women who'd had a baby and who had not had a baby who are now the the woman was in her were in her you know forties and fifties so past that time, and they actually found that the women who'd had a baby actually were doing better. I suspect that was in part because the ones who were doing worse chose not to have as many pregnancies or pregnancies. But um, so we don't think of there being a long term consequences to disease activity from pregnancy. It's usually sort of you get an increase in disease that you might get an increase in disease activity after delivery. And to be honest, in my mind, in my experience, what I see is that women sort of go back to their baseline disease activity um, before they were. And, and so if you're not on any medicines, you go back to where you were, your disease activity before medicines, which many of you might cringe when you think of that moment, right? Back before somebody figured out that you had rheumatoid arthritis, and before somebody gave you medicine, you go back to that point if you're not taking any medicines after you deliver. So what I do actually is I always get my med my patients right back on good medicine after they deliver. So if we've pulled back medicines at all during pregnancy, we usually go back to whatever they were on before they were doing before they were pregnant when they were doing really well. And we get back to those drugs within a couple weeks of delivery before the postpartum flare. And with that, I really don't see very many postpartum flares at all. Great, and I think you just answered uh, uh, another question we had from Christopher around the same same topic, uh, who had requested that you talk a little bit about post post birth flare and whether or not medications that had worked previous to getting pregnant would continue to work post yeah. post pregnancy. Yeah, they, they usually do continue to work. Every once in a while, somebody will have gotten resistant to something, but usually, I just go back to whatever they were was working before. Okay. Great, and there's, uh, I, I know you had some concluding uh, I, questions to, to review as well, um, but I'll just throw this out and maybe you can sort of combine it with your own questions. Uh, you know, you've provided a lot of great information on this webinar 
Um, what happens if, and this is a question from someone in the audience, what happens if uh, someone's doctor is telling them something very different to what you've, you've been seeing? Uh, is there somewhere they can direct their doctor to get this information? Uh -huh. That's a great question. So that happens a lot, actually. Um, people will come to see me and, and they'll, you know, I, I give them a, a sort of a totally different story than what they've heard before. For years, their doctors have always said you have to stop all your medicines when you get pregnant and, oh, there's no way you could get pregnant on that medication and, and so on. And so um, I know that that's a big challenge for women, right? You can't just walk in and, and argue with your doctor. It's a hard argument to win. Um, so there's a couple of, uh, so one resource is the, the, um, the European rheumatology, uh, group, they, it's called ULAR. They, um, actually came out with guidelines about a year ago that basically is basically what I'm just telling you. Um, also the American College of Rheumatology is coming out with guidelines next year and I'm, I'm on that committee. I don't know exactly what the guidelines will say at all. Actually, we haven't decided yet, but I suspect it will be fairly in line with what I'm telling you today. So those things will hopefully help. But I really think that um, it's a challenge to figure out, uh, you know, you, it's hard to just, you can't just walk in and, and, and hand something to your doctor that you printed off the internet. Um, you need to have something, if you do that, it, it needs to clearly come from a, a good, reliable source. And, and there's not a great one out there yet um, that, that patients can, can use. The, the mother to baby site is, is a good one for that. Um, the, another place that's actually good is, um, at the arthritis power, you know, they just, uh, this past year, I helped them a little bit, but they did all the heavy lifting on it was to really put together patient guidelines for pregnancy and reproductive health. It's a great document with a ton of information in it. So you could print that off potentially and take it into your doctor, but I hope in the future that we'll have, um, sort of easier things that you can shorter things that are really clearly official that, that won't make you look like you're came across some crazy woman on the internet, um, but that really are legitimate and um, that your doctor will really be able to accept and engage with you on to have like a good conversation. Because I know often, you know, if I just said, go talk to your doctor about all this, uh, your doctor would probably not tell you all of this. So, Great. so let me go through. Are there any other questions? Or I have a couple things I want to talk about too. Sure, go ahead. All right. I can't believe I talked so long. Um, all right, so uh, the, the key, one of the first key things I want to talk about is the flu. So um, on these Facebook pages, I often see women talking about the flu, and um, this is one thing that, that often I think um, people are not getting all the right information on, unfortunately. So this woman wrote, is anybody else worried about getting the flu virus when pregnant? Um, I'm honestly thinking of avoiding a lot of people when it comes winter. That's when bubble be due, and uh, we're predicting a really bad strain of flu this year, uh, this winter in Australia. So um, my answer to that is um, while you're pregnant, even when you're not pregnant, get a flu shot. Um, flu shots are safe during pregnancy. They've been very well studied during pregnancy and been shown to be safe. And in fact, it's been shown to be safer to get the flu shot than not because catching the flu while you're pregnant can be very dangerous. It actually puts you at much higher risk of getting hospitalized pneumonia and even dying. Um, and it, if you catch the flu and those really high fevers you get with the flu can actually harm your baby when you're pregnant. So it's like you're cooking your little baby in there um, and it actually can impact brain development, can actually increase the risk for autism potentially. So um, getting a flu shot is really important. It also will protect your baby from flu the next season when your baby is born and is out running around but is not able to get a flu shot. And then other people around you should also get the flu shot. Your husband should get a flu shot. Um, it just makes it so that he won't bring it home to you. The next question is, my son was diagnosed with type B flu and I'm 16 weeks and now I have a low grade fever, aches and I'm feeling bad. So clearly she also has type B flu. Um, any tips on over the counter meds I can take till I see my doctor? Um, the Tylenol isn't cutting it. I'm looking for something that might help alleviate flu symptoms. So this is a woman who needs to go to urgent care, all right? If you are 16 weeks pregnant, particularly if you have an autoimmune disease, especially if you're taking any immunosuppression, if you're on prednisone, Imuran, a TNF inhibitor, anything that suppresses your immune system, you need to be seen by a physician 
you need to go to urgent care or you need to call your OB or you need to call your primary care doctor, you need to get seen that day. They should probably do a flu um, test, you know, they put that horrible swab up your nose that feels terrible. And then they should give you Tamiflu if you have the flu. Tamiflu is an antiviral medication um, that's specifically for the flu. It is prescription only, so it's, it's basically like an antibiotic, but against a virus. Um, it has been shown to be safe in pregnancy. And again, it's safer than having the flu in pregnancy. So if you think you might have the flu and it's flu season, if other people around you are having the flu and you get a fever, you need to go right away to get checked out. Um, and if somebody close to you, if somebody living in your house has catches the flu, then you need to get Tamiflu because you can actually take it, you take less of it and you only take it once a day and it actually prevents you from catching the flu. And it's very effective at that. So um, the flu is not something to, to ignore when you're pregnant. It can make you extraordinarily sick and can actually kill you. And so it's really important that you um, take care of the flu. Um, this was a question about preterm birth in lupus. And indeed, preterm birth is quite common, um, particularly women who have very active lupus, uh, preterm birth is common. I had a couple that I really wanted to talk about. I'll, ask, I'll look at this one since I'm sure people want to know. So um, this woman wrote, um, do you know if there is any link between lupus and autistic kids? I'm just curious. I've been seeing many loopy moms, uh, kids with autism. Uh, I'm sure there's some genetic or DNA alteration. So I was just looking through the literature again today and actually found a brand new paper about this. But um, And it appears that there's, there, there's not a, a clear trend towards women with lupus having more autistic children. When you compare, so the first study there is from Taiwan and you can see that the rates of autism are really very similar between the general population, women with lupus and women with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and then the second study is from Canada, from Montreal, and you can see that there, there does appear to be potentially an increase in autism in that, in that group. So about a twice the risk. Um, in a review that looked at 30 different studies, it looked at lots of different developmental changes that could happen in offspring. Uh, learning deficits did appear to be somewhat more common, particularly in boys of women with lupus, and perhaps there was more ADHD. I suspect that a fair amount of that is due to the preterm birth that we see, particularly for women with lupus. Um, and, uh, and that's likely what's driving a lot of the uh, learning deficits um, um, there. Okay, great. Um, and then I think this is our last question from Christopher, who who asked us actually specifically about embryo um, and if that's an option during pregnancy, particularly um, asked why you didn't mention it uh, when you listed other TNF inhibitors. So if there is a specific reason you didn't mention it, um, if you can talk a little bit to that. Yeah, so um, there is a specific reason that I didn't mention Embrel, and that's that it's a little bit controversial now. Um, and it's really um, Embrel recently changed their label um, to reflect some data that has come out of the mother-to-baby group. Um, that data, um, and I think it's worth reading on the um, label that you probably have on the medication at home, um, says that uh, in their uh, study of women who took Embrel at some point during pregnancy, um, and then they followed out the children and they looked for birth defects. They did find an increase in birth defects um, in babies exposed to embryo. Um, and that sounds scary, but when, you, when we think about a medication that causes birth defects, um, we know from lots of experience with other medications that cause birth defects that they, that they also cause other problems. So a medication that causes birth defects for real like where the drug is the problem, will also cause an increase in pregnancy loss because you can imagine that those are the fetuses that have a really severe defect. Um, they also cause minor birth defects, so little tiny subtle things that people don't usually notice. Their ears, baby's ears are too low or their thumb is jointed differently or something, you know, something that people don't usually notice, but an expert would notice when they actually examine the baby and they're actually looking for these sorts of things. Um, and there needs to be um, exposure of the drug to the, um, to the developing fetus at the right time during, um, just during development. So um, fetal development in the first couple of months of life is very 
clearly dictated by week about what exactly is happening, what's actually growing. Um, and so you need to have, you know, if there's a heart problem, you need to have exposure of that drug at the right time during gestation to have that kind of heart problem. And then finally, um, a medication that really causes birth defects generally causes a pattern of birth defects. So all the babies have a specific problem. Like with mycophenolate, all the babies have, ear, most of the babies have ear problems. So um, because it causes a specific problem in a developing fetus. So with Embril, we really don't see those things. So we see an increase in the number of birth defects, but we don't see any increase in pregnancy loss. And in fact, there was something of a decrease in pregnancy loss in that population. Um, we see no increase in minor birth defects at all. Um, and in the study, they actually send a doctor, like a doctor flies across the country to examine all the babies with and without embryo exposure. So there's really no, and, and the doctor who flies out doesn't know if the baby was exposed to embryo or not. So there's really no increase in minor birth defects. Um, we don't believe embryo crosses with placenta um, at the, in the first trimester, which is when the fetus is developing. So we don't think there should be actual drug exposure to the developing fetus in order to cause any of these birth defects. And then there's not a pattern. So the birth defects were kind of all over the map um, and didn't uh, have any kind of pattern. It's not like they were all heart problems or all ear problems uh, or even a, an increase in heart problems or an increase in ear problems. It was just a random assortment of, of birth defects. So, um, so that's basically what the data says. Um, I don't know if it says it all in that detail in the, um, in the label. And the, the FDA, um, because the FDA knows all that, all those different features to what causes a birth defect, did not put uh, what we call a black box warning or a real warning on the drug that it causes birth defects. Um, they just wanted to, they made the company put all the data there and didn't make them say that it causes birth defects. So, so Embryol is sort of in a gray zone, I think, that if you look at just the, the, the bare numbers, it looks like it might be worrisome. If you listen and think about all the different things that make something uh, be a medicine that causes birth defects, it really doesn't hit any of the, um, any of the things needed for that except for that one number. So I think that if you're doing great on Embryol and um, then I think it's okay to conceive and to, to take it during, medic during pregnancy. I've had lots of patients take it during pregnancy. Um, if you're trying to pick a new TNF inhibitor to take um, because you're going to get pregnant and, and you know you're going to get pregnant, I, I probably wouldn't pick um, Enbrel if it, if it was me. Um, and I've had women um, be wanting to sort of uh, uh, make that choice um, in my clinic recently when I go through all of that data. So that's sort of the asterisk that's next to Enbrel when we talk about all the um, TNF inhibitors. I don't think it's wrong to have a pregnancy and uh, take Embryol, um, but I think that uh, it's, it's not a slam dunk like the Humira um, data is. And the Humira data is from the exact same study showing that it doesn't increase birth defects and it doesn't increase pregnancy loss or minor birth defects or anything else. So, um, so that's why I didn't really um, address Embryol before, but that's kind of the story about the Embryol data. Great, thanks. This is all great information. Um, I think we've covered all the questions, Megan, unless there is, if there's any additional information that you think wasn't brought up through the question um, and that you'd like to, sort of, you know, uh, bring up now. Um, so one thing that we didn't really talk about is um, celiac disease, um, but I, I think that there probably are some women who are listening who um, have celiac disease. So celiac disease is, is an autoimmune condition, but it's a slightly different autoimmune con condition in the sense that um, you know, women with celiac don't need to be on all these medications that we've been talking about, um, and celiac is really managed entirely differently than our other diseases. You know, celiac is a, is a sensitivity um, and a reaction to gluten or wheat, and so um, the treatment for celiac is basically um, avoiding all exposure to wheat, um, particularly through diet. So, um, you know, as I said, there is some uh, data suggesting that, um, pretty good data that women with undiagnosed celiac disease have higher rates of pregnancy complication and infertility, um, pregnancy loss, preterm delivery, particularly babies are small. Um, there is uh, much less data, however, on women with celiac who um, are avoiding gluten. So avoiding gluten makes many of the symptoms of celiac disease go away. We suspect that it makes many of the 
pregnancy problems also go away. Um, but it is, uh, there is just less data on that because um, it's harder, those are harder projects to do. Um, so I think that um, it would be great to have, have more data on that. I think that the assumption for women uh, and certainly the, the recommendation for women with celiac disease um, is to uh, follow the diet as closely as you humanly possible, as humanly possible during pregnancy as well as when you're trying to conceive. Um, make sure that your vitamin levels um, are where they need to be, um, vitamin D in particular, um, and take supplements if necessary. So your doctor can uh, check specific, uh, specific vitamins for people with celiac disease that can be low and um, should make sure that you're adequately supplemented. Um, eat um, as much healthy food as you can get in you and as little gluten as possible. Um, and I think that that certainly is the, the expected to improve pregnancy outcomes for women with celiac, both the ability to get pregnant um, as well as the ability to carry a, a healthy baby all the way to term. Fantastic. Thank you. I think we're probably about out of time, aren't we? Oh, yes. So I could go on, as you can tell, for hours. If anybody has other questions, please feel free to send them in, and we'll see if there's another way that we can answer those. And I will let you yeah, I wish, close us out, but thank you all for listening. Yeah, no, that was great. I wish we, I wish we kind of had an extra hour because we have so many questions here. Um, but thank you. That was fantastic. I think um, what we can do, seeing that we have so many different questions, uh, that are unanswered and, and we do apologize we sort of try to answer as many questions as possible because we have just one hour to squeeze in everything it, it sort of becomes difficult but what we can do is uh, simply take your questions we've saved them we can take them back to Dr. Uh, Dr. Klaus and get them answered and then when we upload this recording and share it with you through our website uh, we can have those questions answered and posted there for you as well um, so that way, most of your answers, most of your questions will be addressed in, in some form or the other. But we do apologize if we weren't able to answer all questions. Um, with that, I know we're sort of at the top of the hour. So thank you again, Dr. Close. This was fantastic, great information. Um, thank you for taking the time to be with us on this webinar. And thank you, everyone, for listening in for your questions. And we'll send you more information on the next webinar.